All right, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Our Friends Life Care Vigor Wellness webinar today is Understanding Memory, How It Works, and What to Do When It Doesn't. My name is Katie Starantino, and I am the Director of Wellness Initiatives. So if you've joined us before, you know that there's not a chat box for today's presentation, but there is a Q&A box. So if you just hover your mouse over the bottom of the screen, you'll see that Q&A box pop up. We do encourage your questions. Feel free to send them throughout. Uh, our speaker will get to them at the end, but definitely feel free to send them as they come up for you. So now I would like to introduce today's speaker, Lauren Squabish. Lauren is a speech language pathologist and owner of Neuro Speech Services, a private practice based in Northern Virginia that offers person-centered speech, language, and cognitive therapy to adults with neurological disorders. Lauren has 21 years of experience working in hospitals and rehabilitation centers and is passionate about educating the community to help make com complex information approachable and easy to understand. So we look forward to hearing from you today, Lauren. Thank you, Katie. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, I can't see anyone's faces, but I'm so happy that you have taken time in your morning uh, to chat with me. And I'm also gonna say hi to my mom, my mom, because I know she's out there listening. Um, so as Katie mentioned, I uh, am an owner of a private practice. Um, and what I do, which is really exciting, is I'm actually going into people's homes and where they work uh, in the community to really make sure that we are tackling the problems that people experience related to how they are thinking or communicating. Uh, and it's very rewarding. And a big part of what I like to do is to help people understand and feel empowered so that they can manage whatever their cognitive concerns are. So today's, um, today's talk is gonna really focus on, on that and have, um, uh, we're gonna bring some education to you, but we're also gonna bring hopefully um, some good feelings and some inspirations uh, because there's always something every one of us can do to make thinking uh, and memory a little less um, challenging, a little more successful. And so we're gonna talk about that today. Okay, so uh, number one is we are going to talk about memory and the brain, and I am not a, um, a neuroscientist, but a lot of what I do is trying to understand what is happening in the brain that might explain what I'm seeing, so that I can then share that with someone um, who's experiencing those things. So we're going to talk about neuroanatomy real quick, super simple, nothing too complicated, uh, and then we're going to talk about how memory works, what that system is. Um, we're gonna talk about the different types of memory. I bet a lot of you are familiar with short-term memory and long-term memory, but there's actually some additional distinctions that I will go over. We are also gonna talk about other cognitive skills related to memory. So this is important to recognize that most people, when they think about their thinking, uh, really will talk about memory and it's very important, but there are other cognitive skills that we rely on that we may not even be aware of that can definitely have an influence on how well our memory is functioning. We are definitely gonna go over the normal age-related changes to the brain because anyone who's aging knows that things change uh, and your brain is certainly no exception. Uh, I will talk about signs of concern. So these would be things that may indicate uh, something different than normal aging, something that may actually be um, happening uh, in a more of a neurodegenerative pattern. We're gonna talk about how to improve, and I put in parentheses, support your memory, um, because we may not be able to necessarily return it to what it was when you were 20, um, but we can support the memory or have suggestions to support memory. So the experience of remembering uh, is a more successful event. So it could be more compensatory, but as long as it's working, I say, let's, let's focus on that. And then finally, some wellness tips uh, for optimal brain function. Okay, so let's, dig in, we're gonna start with memory and the brain. So some of you may have different levels of background. So I'll kind of give this uh, overview will be um, pretty simple, but um, so we'll take a look at the different parts of the brain. So basically we have a brain, right? It has a right side and it has a left side. Uh, and each side has different lobes, different regions that serve different functions. And um, it's color coded in this picture, but what they're really finding is uh, people who are researching the brain is that there's all sorts of highways 
that travel, information travels between all of these sections. So it's not so much about the regions anymore, it's more about the highways if we think about it that way. Um, but to really uh, just kind of give you an overview, the frontal lobe, which is here in red, is the largest part of our brains. It's about 40%, it's very important. It's the last to develop in terms of de uh, developmental maturity. Um, then we have moving backwards, we have the parietal lobe that's very much responsible for knowing where our bodies are in space uh, and sensory input. Uh, in the back of our brains, we have our occipital lobe that is responsible for visual processing. And coming back around again, we've got the purple section, which is the temporal lobe, which houses a lot of our language skills and abilities. And then below, we've got the cerebellum, uh, which really controls a lot of coordination of movements, but also has some important role in cognition and thinking. And then if we were to slice the brain open, take it apart, the two lobes apart, we have a lot of different structures that are um, subcortical. So not on the outside, the kind of like hills and valleys part, but on the middle, inside part. And a lot of these actually have to do uh, with memory. So if we take a look at this, um, you may see at the bottom the amygdala, but I'm gonna show you some pictures here that really talk about some key uh, anatomical regions that are really essential for memory. So um, from the top, we have the amygdala. Um, I'm actually going to talk about that one last, but the amygdala um, are these uh, tiny little almond shape kind of structures. Uh, down below, we have the hippocampus, uh, and then we have the frontal cortex. So for each of these, you notice we have a right and a left. Um, they are bilateral. And we're going to start by talking about the hippocampus. So the hippocampus is, again, we have one on the left and the right, and they are located sort of in that inner part of the temporal lobe. Um, and they interact with the prefrontal cortex. Remember, we talked about those sort of highways. So there's a strong connection between the hippocampus and the front part of our brain. And the hippocampus, it has a, plays a very key role in transferring information from our short-term to our long-term memory. Um, some things to know about the hippocampus is it's really susceptible to anoxia or hypoxia, which is when you're not getting enough oxygen uh, in your body. So I've had some patients in my memory uh, who have really had profound uh, deprivation of oxygen, sometimes uh, when your heart stops, for example, and you get resuscitated uh, and you are, you are able to return uh, your resuscitation, you survive that event. Um, the hippocampus is just susceptible to the stresses of deprivation of oxygen, and that can be a pretty profound um, deficit uh, where your memory is um, significantly impaired. And uh, probably the most famous case of a hippocampus, oh, here's the hippocampus, guys. It looks like a seahorse. So the thing on the right is an actual seahorse. You do not have that in your brain. Uh, the thing on the left is the hippocampus. But looks like a seahorse, right? So that's actually what it looks like. And again, you've got two of them. Um, the most famous case of hippocampus uh, function, kind of what helped us to understand how it all works uh, is the case of HM. And HM back in 1953 was suffering intractable seizures. Uh, and the surgery for that at the time was to take out both hippocampi to treat the seizures. And as a result, um, his seizures deteriorate, his seizures decreased, which was obviously the goal, very important, but he lost his ability to transfer short-term memory into long-term memory. His previous long-term memory remained intact, but he always thought that the date was the day of his surgery. And he was unable to learn anything new from that time. And he lived into his eighties and he was widely studied. It's sort of a famous case in, in neuroscience because it really helped to understand that role of the hippocampus. And obviously then really think about, um, you know, whether removing this organ is a wise idea. Obviously in a case of seizure activity, you know, there's other things that they may want to try first. So um, what they noticed about HM is that he could participate in activities, in motor activities in particular, and he could learn how to get better at something, but he never had any memory of going through that process. So he might have gotten better at playing a game, but it was as if he was playing it for the first time every time. So really profound, very interesting case. Um, the, pre the frontal cortex is another major player. This really has a, a ongoing conversations uh, with the hippocampus. 
Um, and it's responsible for our higher level thinking. So these are the parts of the brain. Um, you know, we think about teenagers and, and people in their early 20s not having great judgment. That's because the frontal cortex is just coming into its development about between 25 and 27 years old. So it's really responsible for some very high level um, thinking. But it also has these dense connections with these subcortical structures that are crucial for memory. Um, and in particular, um, the prefrontal cortex, which is sort of like right behind your forehead, um, this is responsible for temporarily holding on to information and then calling up previously remembered information. So we'll talk about that phase in our memory in a little while. Um, but a famous case that talks about the, the damage to the frontal lobe, I'm sure some of you have heard of this poor guy, Phineas Gage, who was a railroad worker back in 1848. He was um, working on a crew laying down new tracks in Vermont. And he was using this tamping iron that you see him holding in the picture on the right uh, to pack explosive powder. Uh, into a hole when it detonated. And it sent this tamping iron through his left cheek and his eye and through his brain. And incredibly, he survived. Um, but he was a completely different man. Prior to um, this incident, he was very sweet, family man, very kind, kind and generous. And afterwards, his personality completely changed. Um, he was using uh, gross profanity. He became unemployable because of his cognitive changes. And uh, ultimately, he uh, died of seizures. Um, the thing about the frontal lobe is that it's because it takes up so much space, it's actually pretty susceptible to a lot of um, injury and disease. So if you think about people when they fall, when they are in a car crash, the frontal lobe kind of takes the, the brunt of it. Um, but also the frontal lobe is particularly affected by certain types of dementias. Um, there's a dementia called the frontal temporal lobe dementia. Um, and that's obviously a major uh, phenomenon in the frontal lobe. And then finally, the amygdala. So the amygdala um, is, name means almond. It's kind of probably describes the shape of it. I've never seen one in person, um, but that's definitely what it means. And again, we have two of them and they are seated in the sort of the inside of the frontal, uh, the temporal lobe rather. And this produces an unconscious, reaction to stimuli, particularly uh, fear. So um, this is much more of a sensory experience, a reaction that we have, um, and it feeds information to the frontal lobe. So we might have some you know, fear exposure and our brain says, hey, you know what? Uh, snakes, they're super scary. Don't go near snakes anymore. Um, and so what it does is it feeds that information back up to our brain to the frontal lobe. And the frontal lobe is able to kind of plan and organize uh, responses based on this. So the amygdala is very much uh, a memory system for emotionally salient events. And the case that uh, is sort of famous in understanding the role of the amygdala, um, there's an interesting case of a woman known as SM who had a very rare uh, genetic disease uh, where she had this sort of calcifications that formed um, in her amygdala, uh, a disease called Urbach-Wyeth disease. And she was written up as this woman who knew no fear. Um, she was exposed, of course, again, neuroscience loves to understand, right? So scientists would expose her to all these scary things and she had no reaction. She would go right up to things that were, you know, really scary and she would just engage and interact with them. Um, so she was sort of written up as the woman who knew no fear. Um, and what was interesting is that obviously fear is important because it protects us, right? So we, we go back from dangerous things because we, we become afraid of them. But she also had a hard time with understanding fear in other people. So again, you can see how this, um, this brain region may have some other implications in terms of social communication, social interaction uh, when it doesn't work. So brief overview of the anatomy. Those are the main players in our brains. Um, let's talk a little bit now about how memory works. I, my whole career have always worked with people who've had some type of brain injury, um, or an illness that has affected cognition. So even if someone has, um, you know, nothing on a finding of an MRI, um, the trauma of going through, let's say 
you know, surgery that goes bad um, or, or a terrible car accident, um, those patients with multiple traumas can oftentimes experience some changes in memory. But a lot of times people say, my memory's good or my memory's bad. It's as if memory is this one thing and um, it's sort of immutable. Uh, and so what I really wanna make sure is we understand is that memory is really a whole brain process. So as we just kind of talked about all these different regions in the brain, we really need to understand that there's different sort of steps in memory, in making memories and in using memories. And it's really sort of crucial to understand that when you're having a breakdown in your memory, we really have to, as a professional, it's my job to understand where in this process are we having a breakdown. So I'm gonna go through each individual step and then later on we'll sort of talk about how to address these. Um, but the first step is attention. Uh, and when we, really think about paying attention. This is really the sensory input um, that we experience that allows us to engage with something and then figure out, do I need to remember this? So what you see, what you smell, what you feel, um, all of this incoming message is part of that attention phase. Um, and we hold these briefly in our sensory memory until we get to the next step. But a lot of times that I'm bringing your attention to attention because this is such a critical phase of memory. Uh, and as we'll see in a little bit, this is really sort of the criteria for if you're going to remember something or not. And I'm sure a lot of you can think about a time when someone said, but I told you that we were going to leave at seven o'clock. And you think, I didn't hear that. Well, were you attending to that person giving you that message? Probably not. I have definitely been guilty of that in my household. So first and foremost is we have to have attention ready to go. Next is encoding. And encoding is this process where we're basically having the hippocampus and the frontal cortex are talking back and forth, trying to figure out how are we gonna remember this information? What kind of memory system do we already have going? What other schema can we attach this incoming information to? So this is kind of like packaging and preparing information. Um, for the next step, which is storage. So storage involves activation of the visual and the auditory and the somatosensory uh, somato parts of the brain. And the hippocampus is like a conductor here. It's really kind of saying, okay, we've got this information. We've recognized it's important. It's related to this other thing you know. So we're gonna put it in this one particular place. So what something feels like, what something sounds like, um, what you know about something, that's where we're storing information. And then finally, retrieval. Uh, which is the reactivation of those same pathways that we laid down when we stored information. And we do that either at a conscious or unconscious uh, level. So we're really manipulating this information in multiple different steps in order to make a memory. So it's a pretty complicated process. And I always like to give analogies to my patients and families because brains are complicated. And I think it really helps to understand um, when we can put it into a practical context. So here you see this beautiful trail on this grassy, grassy kind of meadow. Everyone knows I, in my family, I love a meadow. Uh, it was my pandemic project. I dug up some of my front yard and I planted a meadow and it just makes me so happy. Um, and when I worked at the hospital that I just left, uh, they changed the parking a lot. And so I had to park on the street and to get to the hospital, I had to cross a field. And sometimes I could see someone kind of in the distance and I could see their footsteps. They had just walked across the path. Um, but then, you know, at the end of the day, you couldn't really tell where you walked. The grass had blown, the wind had sort of shifted and it just looked like the fields had been untouched. But because I parked there for 16 years, I walked across that path a lot. And suddenly you could really see the grass had, you know, sort of been uh, pressed down and a path was forming. And, you know, even if it was raining or the lawn got, you know, tall, the lawn guys hadn't been there yet. I could always tell the path I had taken because I had taken it so many times. And this is really how your brain works in terms of creating uh, hardwired roots 
for you to be able to access information. And so when you have heard someone's name once or you've learned a fact once, that is not enough to trust that you will remember it forever. You need to be taking that pathway. You need to be accessing that information over and over and over again to really have it be uh, reliably stored in your brain. Uh, and this is really essential to understand is that when we have an injury to the brain, we need to make new pathways. And so the concept of neuroplasticity, which is certainly, you know, the thing that makes me so happy to work with individuals with, uh, with brain injury, but also people who, um, who are out there who have normal healthy brains and want to continue to make them healthy, is this idea that by manipulating information and doing things to create a new pathway, we can make new connections. We can make different routes. So if this one becomes flooded and we can't take that anymore, we can take another way. And again, the same problem will happen. I don't know which route I take. I can barely see where my steps were from yesterday, but if I take that every day, I make a new path. But it's work. It is really, and we have to make it a very conscious effort to say, I'm making new connections in my brain. Okay, so there's different types of memory. So, um, we're going to talk more about long-term memory because I think a lot of people sort of think about that one. And that's obviously what we're really hoping to get information into ultimately. Um, but let's talk a little bit about working memory because I don't know that a lot of people know what working memory is. And working memory um, is kind of like a juggler. This is where that information is moving around, constantly shifting. We're taking it, but we're not able to kind of we can't juggle forever. We eventually have to put those, you know, put the things that we're juggling down into a certain place. So examples of working memory might be um, remembering to in retrieve ingredients as you're cooking. Um, and maybe, you know, you're, you, you know sort of briefly what you need and you can go and get it and then you put it down and then you don't need to remember that information anymore. Um, or if I gave you my phone number, you would hold on to that until you did something with it. Maybe you'd write it down, maybe you would dial it, but then you would let it go. Working memory says, you know, I'm just a temporary kind of uh, manipulator of information. And short-term memory is actually that holding place. Uh, so working memory says, let's just put this in here for a second, small units of information, um, but it gets weeded out. We don't hold everything in our short-term memory. Um, it's definitely a place where we're going to access that. And then we're going to say, I think I need this. I'm going to put it into my long-term memory bank. So we have these different phases of memory. And a lot of times I will counsel people, uh, in my, my clients who say, you know, they're so distraught by memory. They feel as if they need to remember everything. So they go to a meeting and there's this sense of, I went and I tried to take notes and I kind of got lost. And, um, and I just can't remember anything. And some of it is trying to help them to understand the phases of the memory. Maybe there's some sort of, you know, breakdown in that early phase of attention, but also to say, we don't, we don't need to remember everything. Let's be strategic about where we're putting our resources so that we can remember just the most important information. Uh, and that a lot of times can kind of take the burden off someone who feels like the memory isn't good and they're trying to remember, or they have expectations of themselves to remember everything. And that's just not the case. Uh, your memory is, is, is not an endless resource. And so we need to be really smart about how we're using it. So let's talk about long-term memory um, because I think a lot of people know this term, but there's lots of different sort of systems here. So long-term memory can be divided into declarative and non-declarative. So declarative would be, um, this is that knowing that, as in, I know that I had um, a walk with my husband this morning and then I made a cup of tea. That's fact, that's information that I have. Um, and I, I experienced it and I wanted to remember it because I knew I was gonna talk to you today and I wanted to be able to kind of tell you what I did this morning. And then non-declarative is knowing how. So this is information uh, that lies within parts of the brain that are responsible for initiating and executing a motor action. So um, I had to rely on my non-declarative memory when my, uh, my daughter wanted to crochet something. And I know that I know how to crochet and I could probably tell her where she could get the crochet hooks, but I really had to pick up the crochet and kind of do it a little bit, uh, which I, Fortunately, I was able to just snap right back into it because it's in my non-declarative memory. It's a motor procedure that I 
um, I didn't have to think too hard about, but I definitely had to do it in order to teach it. So when we think about our declarative memory, the information that we know, we sort of have two different subsets. We have episodic memory, which is remembering experiences. Um, so this is based on your own individual experience with the world. Um, this is something where, you know, um, certainly if there's a higher emotional content, um, you will remember it more. That's um, definitely, uh, you know, we can think about where we were on 9-11 or how we felt at our wedding. Um, these are definitely emotional experiences where emotions are tied into encoding and storing that memory. And then we have semantic knowledge, which is in the declarative memory. So these are facts. You know, you can tell me uh, that it's 2021. I was joking with Katie earlier as we were warming up because she mentioned that it was October. And I was like, actually, it's November. Um, sometimes that information can, can trick us up a little bit. But the information that we know that we can refer to is stored in our semantic. That's sort of your, um, you know, the facts, the general facts and meanings and concepts that you know. And then that non-declared is procedural. So my crochet example is a great, you know, thing. We we don't have to necessarily think about the fact that I know how to type on my keyboard. I can just type on my keyboard. It's a motor pattern. I can do it, you know, fairly easily as long as I'm awake and I've had my coffee. Um, I can get on there, um, riding a bike. These are sequences, these are motor patterns that we didn't know how to do. And then we learned how to do them. And now we can rely on them as something that our bodies know how to do, even if we don't have to actually list out all of the steps. And then there's something called perspective memory. Um, and perspective memory is remembering to remember something in the future. So um, this definitely is a nice transition into thinking about these other cognitive skills that are related to memory because remembering to remember isn't actually just memory, it's other executive function skills, uh, which you'll see in the next slide I'm gonna show you, those are some of the higher level skills. So someone may intend to say, oh yeah, I'm gonna remember, I'll pick you up at the bus stop at you know, 5 p.m. and then 5 p.m. comes and goes uh, and it hasn't happened. And it's not necessarily you didn't remember to do that, you forgot to remember to remember. So the analogy I like to give when we think about thinking, this concept of metacognition is of a building. Um, again, you know, I'm all about the analogies and thinking about our th thinking is so complicated that we really do have to have a sense of how does this all work? And uh, when talking to students or talking to patients and families, I really like to talk about it in terms of layers. So your first step, this isn't even the lobby of the building, this is in the foundation. This is under the ground of our building. In order for it to stand up and be safe and reliable, the foundation is attention. So when I'm working with someone who's had a stroke or a brain injury, um, and the family says, oh, you know, I'm just, he doesn't remember this, or he's unable to push the call bell, or, you know, something that they're expecting them to do, I first look at attention. Because if we're not attending to our environment or attending to ourselves, all the other levels will not work, okay? Our crack in our foundation is really significant. So we shore that up. And so looking at attention is really, really big when we're looking to rehabilitate a, someone's brain. And then once we have attention secured, we then look at processing. And processing is that incoming management of incoming stimuli. So as you are listening to me talking, you might be looking at my hand gestures, you might be looking at my images, you might be listening to my voice, and you're sort of, your brain is kind of, I imagine the gears are turning as you're thinking about your own experiences or thinking about someone else you know, or hopefully you're thinking of a question that you wanna ask later. Processing is managing that incoming stimuli and it requires attention. And then we can get to memory, right? So we can't even expect anyone to remember if we don't have attention processing uh, working in our favor. Uh, and then once we remember, then we can get into organization. Um, organization is a higher level skill, so to speak, that requires the ability to remember. Um, so organizing the steps of an activity, I have to remember what those steps are. Um, in order to organize, um, you know, an event, I have to remember who's coming to that event. What do we need? What do we have to have? 
when is it going to be? So uh, that is a, uh, a skill that requires, again, memory and processing and attention. And so on, problem solving, being able to identify a, an appropriate solution requires that you go back into your memory and figure out well, what did I try last time? Or what do I know is going to be effective or ineffective? And then reasoning, which is making a judgment or determination. And then finally, the penthouse of this building, those top, top uh, level skills, cognitive skills, uh, are called executive functions. And we talked about the frontal lobe earlier. The frontal lobe is where the executive functions are really housed. Um, so this is goal-directed behavior. This is coming up with a plan. This is executing that plan. This is monitoring the plan as it goes along and course correcting as necessary. Um, this is very much the skills that lead us to be you know, successful uh, adults. Okay. Um, so obviously we talked a lot about those cognitive functions that can impact memory, but just as essential and vital is really looking at mental health. And I think after um, this rough pandemic that we are still trying to, you know, claw ourselves out of, um, this became more of a, um, I would say, a, I would say popular topic, but I think we're becoming more socially, it's more socially acceptable that we can talk about mental health and mental health breakdowns. Um, but mental health can absolutely influence memory. And what they think is that it's definitely related to cortisol, which is that stress hormone. Uh, in short bursts, cortisol is great because it gives us that fight or flight uh, response. And so when we see something happening that's stressful, cortisol is that chemical that really gets us to be able to react uh, and respond. Um, but when we have chronic exposure to cortisol, when we have too much, it's excessive and it's constant, it starts to impair the brain's ability to metabolize it. And so you can see in this cycle down below, we can't really process the cortisol and it can influence how well our hippocampus is functioning. Um, and so there's definitely some chemicals at play. Um, and cortisol exposure can lead to all kinds of health complications, but it can definitely impact the things that we know are important for memory. I'm going to talk about it a little bit in terms of your ability to sleep, uh, emotional distress, uh, nutrition. And of course, we know that attention and focus are those foundational skills in our building, right? So when we can't attend and focus, we're less likely to be able to remember and to learn uh, new, new things. So um, hopefully people who are experiencing or acknowledging stress can have the ability to speak about it uh, with healthcare provider um, and get the help that they need. Okay, so let's talk about normal changes. Um, if you are aging, and all of us are, if you're listening to this, um, you know that things change as you age, right? I am not the first person to tell you this. You can speak to it in your own distinct way. Um, but when we talk about the brain, there's actually very normal things that will change. And I think it's helpful to recognize this because we need to normalize um, aging in general, but certainly brain aging, because there's just things that will happen and it's totally okay. Um, I'll help you to distinguish that from what's a sign of concern, but here are some things that happen to a normal aging brain. And first is that we have reduction in neurotransmitters. Um, a neurotransmitter is a chemical get, that gets released um, when two uh, cells are coming together and it allows a message to go from one to the next. Um, there's lots of different neurotransmitters and chemicals that we have in our brain. Um, that we need for learning and memory. And in particular, acetylcholine is one that helps with learning and memory. Um, and so that gets reduced. And some of you may have heard or even be on a medication uh, called Aricept, uh, which is a drug that is prescribed to try to address uh, cognitive function in people who are diagnosed with something called mild cognitive impairment. Um, and then there's another drug. And so, so Aricept is a drug that tries to um, address neurotransmitter uh, supply. Um, Nemenda is another drug. It's used for more moderate to severe dementia. Um, and it looks at the synapse. So the synapse is that space in between where those little circles are. It's sort of looking at that area. Um, so far, chemically, I don't know that those drugs are really all that successful. Um, you may have heard of the new infusion, uh, which I'll never get the name right, so I won't even try it. 
Um, that doesn't look at neurotransmitters as much as it looks at plaques. Um, but there's definitely a lot of money going into drugs to try to see if we can address this neurotransmitter uh, change in the brain. Remember our little seahorse, our hippocampus? Well, that too is affected by age. It shrinks by 20% um, by the age of 80, they're finding. Another um, thing that happens in the brain is vascular aging. So hopefully you all know that the brain in order to function at its best every day requires blood supply. And so when we have changes in the blood vessels in the brain could be uh, chronic over time, um, such as in this case, we may see some um, stiffening of the blood vessels. Uh, we may have something called atherosclerosis um, or we may have some inflammation. Um, the blood vessels are essentially, uh, I used to teach a class for people who had strokes who came to my rehab program. And we would talk about that blood vessels are basically pipes, right? Your heart is the pump and it brings this blood vessel up to the pipes in your brain. And we want those pipes to be able to be flexible because our blood pressure will go up and down. And we want the blood vessels to be able to accommodate that, those changes in those flows and those pressures. Um, over time, as you age though, your blood vessels become less elastic. And so it compromises the abilities um, to accommodate those changes. Um, and certain medical conditions like diabetes uh, and high blood pressure can have sort of an added effect. Um, you're probably, if you're um, kind of reading about scientific research these days, there's a lot about inflammation that they think. Um, they think that actually Alzheimer's disease is kind of related to this inflammatory process. Certainly if you've heard about people with COVID, that is an immune response, right? That probably leads to inflammation. So uh, in general, the blood vessels become a little stiffer, a little less elastic. And some of them, uh, as they get smaller and smaller and smaller towards the outer regions of the brain, they just don't work anymore. Um, and so sometimes what results is this overall atrophy. Um, so as we age, here's a picture of the brain in an MRI, um, we have tissue loss. And sometimes what happens is at the outer surface of the brain, we have these little blood vessels that just don't work anymore. Uh, they're not able to receive blood and feed those brain cells and those brain cells die as a result. So if you look at the picture on the left, and you look at the outer part of the brain, those um, they're called sulci and gyri. The hills and the valleys are more densely packed together. And then look at the brain on the right. If you look around the outer edge, there's the valleys are a little bit deeper, a little bit wider, right? Uh, and the hills are a little kind of shrunken, a little smaller. Um, and this is atrophy. And this can be very, very normal. In fact, um, I have had plenty of patients where I have looked at their MRIs when I've done my evaluation in the hospital, and I've seen a normal age-related atrophy listed, uh, and this person is highly functioning, um, or were, you know, they were before they came into the, to the hospital. Um, so it's important to recognize that atrophy does not necessarily mean, you know, disability. Uh, it's just a part of normal aging. Some protective factors to think about. Um, is the higher level of education that you have or professional attainment um, that can lead to sort of a reduced rate of atrophy uh, as well as genetics. Let's face it, uh, our genes do a lot of the talking for us. So uh, despite these changes in brain function, I think it's really important to recognize that there actually are a set of skills that are very well preserved in aging, and in fact, people who are older tend to do better than people that are younger, and that's known as crystallized intelligence. So these are the skills, abilities, and knowledge that we have practiced and laid those pathways down through that, through that brain over and over and over again. And our life's experience creates this very um, sort of robust sense of knowledge. So for example, vocabulary, general facts. I mean, you just have lived and experienced. And so you have a lot of this information and this tends to stay stable through your seventies. Um, this is information that you can really rely upon as something that your brain is capable of holding on to, uh, And it is based on life experience and older folks do better, obviously, uh, than younger folks and the ability to draw upon this knowledge and utilize it. So that's your crystallized intelligence. 
Um, your fluid intelligence is probably a little bit different. It's definitely something that we, we see in younger people. And that's that problem solving for new and unfamiliar information. Uh, it requires, um, you know, really rapid attention, the ability to mentally manipulate information and lay down new pathways. So this is something that we can think of as being pretty reliable um, in your 20s through your 30s, and then it ultimately declines with age, um, where it's not that you can't do these things, the fluid intelligence, but um, what really changes and certainly what impacts memory are the processing speed. So a slower speed. Um, or having more difficulty with selective and divided attention. So remember, we talked about that first phase, right? That first phase of memory is being able to process information, having it coming in so that we can do something with it. Um, and this is really, uh, this can be something where, for example, you may have difficulty tuning out a nearby conversation that you're not a part of, but your brain is attending to it. Um, and you may be trying to do something, but you're getting distracted because this noise in the background is, is, um, is preventing you from really processing what you're trying to do. Um, or maybe you're taking longer to recall the name of a movie that you saw uh, or something you experienced. These are the changes. So atten both attention and then the ability, the speed in retrieving information. This is what people tend to get so frustrated by. Um, and these can have some, you know, real impacts on cognition. Uh, and so this is important to recognize that this is very normal. This is a normal process. This is because of the changes that are happening in the brain. And what sometimes happens is people get so distressed because we think, oh no, I forgot my neighbor's name and it was on the tip of my tongue and I could not produce it. He was standing right there at that barbecue and I must be getting dementia. Um, and a lot of times it's these breakdowns or the slower process that becomes so distressing that the emotional response to that experience becomes so powerful that it actually prevents us from being able to take the time we need to retrieve that information. Because we have it, we know it, it's on our crystallized memory, uh, but we couldn't get to it in the time that we sort of expected ourselves to. And this becomes ultimately um, very frustrating. So, but let's talk a little bit about the signs of concern because I think we all can experience that. I'm sure many of us know someone who's had memory breakdowns um, that weren't just that tip of the tongue phenomenon, but actually something that was bad. And so let's really clarify here, um, what are the signs for concern? Because hopefully you know now that there's some changes that are normal. But when we start to get worried, we really think about these 10 early signs of dementia. And I got this from the alzheimers.org website. It's a really wonderful resource if you are um, living with Alzheimer's or you know someone who has a dementia, there's a lot of helpful information on there. But these are the things that really differentiate between normal aging. So memory loss that really disrupts your daily life. So it's not just kind of slow to retrieve a name or you lost your keys, but you're not able to remember um, you know, who your doctor is or how to get to the doctor's office, you're getting lost. Um, it's difficulty with planning or solving problems. And these are not complex problems, but these are some basic things like how to get toast out of the toaster, um, how to um, pull on pants that might have a broken zipper. Uh, it's really having functional breakdowns in your everyday familiar tasks at work or home. And that could include driving um, or even just making a sandwich, things like that. So it's, it's starting to impact your day to day. It's getting confused with time or place. Um, and Katie, I'm gonna throw you under the bus. You know, Katie's okay. She doesn't have dementia just because she thought it was October and it's actually November because that's something that we probably all experience. But she really didn't know where she was sitting at her desk um, or she had no idea what year it was or she thought she was, you know, 17. That's where we would start to get really worried. Um, people with dementia have trouble with visual spatial relationships. So I can remember my um, stepfather uh, my husband's stepfather who had dementia and he had a really hard time seeing his brown shoes on my hardwood floors. He could not differentiate that. And he would tell us, he's like, I can't see my shoes. Uh, it was kind of interesting. He had that insight despite this uh, breakdown. Um, we look at difficulty using and understanding language. So being able to communicate something that breaks down when people have um, a neurodegenerative disease. 
Uh, it's misplacing things, uh, which again, we all do, but it's being unable to kind of think about where would I find that thing? Um, and it's putting things where they wouldn't belong. So putting my wallet in the freezer uh, would not be where it's sort of a typical um, normal breakdown in, in misplacing things would be. Uh, it's decreased or poor judgment. It may be going outside when it's cold out and not wearing uh, appropriate attire. And of course, all of these things, because it can be tremendously isolating. So people tend to withdraw from social interactions. And then there's some um, changes in mood or personality. They're really unpredictable. Uh, so these are the things we definitely get um, very concerned about when we see them in a loved one um, or in a friend. And so this is um, certainly, by the time we're seeing these things, uh, we really need to get to um, a physician, a neurologist, and start to talk about um, some testing to figure out what's happening. So in between normal aging and these 10 signs of early dementia, we do have this sort of in-between space. Uh, and this is sometimes called mild cognitive impairment. Um, it's important to recognize that dementia is not an inevitability. And I think a lot of people just assume, oh, he's getting older, he's going to have dementia. It's absolutely not the case. Um, and same thing with mild cognitive impairment. This oftentimes uh, is just people think, oh, it's just normal. Um, and so we tend to um, miss this. I say we, I mean, medical professionals uh, tend to miss this. And um, for those folks who may evolve into a dementia, which is only about, I think about 10 to 15%, I've heard different statistics, but it's not this inevitable. I have mild cognitive impairment and therefore I will have dementia, uh, but it's this kind of middle step. Um, where it can often stem from either disease or treatment for disease. So you may have a dementia, and this is that first phase, or you may have had a stroke or other vascular changes in those blood vessels in the brain, and that's why you have mild cognitive impairment. Um, people with a traumatic brain injury are at a higher risk, um, but it could also be due to a medication side effect or an underlying health problem that's reversible. And so really being able to be attuned to and sensitive to mild cognitive impairment is so important. And when I started my private practice, I really wanted to make sure that my medical community knew that I could be a resource because part of this is helping people to recognize how thinking works, what's normal, uh, and then also what should we be looking at to see if we could reverse this? So really helping people to advocate for looking at their medications and talking to their doctors, but also the cognitive strategies that we can kind of shore up somebody who's had some cognitive changes so that they're not continuing to deteriorate if their brains weren't necessarily intending to go that way. So some symptoms of mild cognitive impairment uh, would include losing things often, um, forgetting events or appointments, um, it's more word finding difficulty than would be normal. So we know that that tip of the tongue, forgetting a word is, is something that can happen, but this is something that's a little bit more significant, more bothersome. It's starting to become noticeable to people. Um, it may be some difficulties with movement and loss of smell, which isn't it interesting with the COVID pandemic, loss of smell and taste um, really can be more probably neurological um, phenomena. Uh, and mild cognitive impairment certainly can be sort of that initial early stage. Um, so it's important to recognize it, I think, as we're all hopefully becoming more attuned to um, what's going on with our bodies and advocating for yourself. Hopefully, if you're starting to notice these things, um, speaking up to a physician is certainly a way to get some testing done to figure out what's happening. Is there something we could reverse? Um, and certainly then to pinpoint helpful resources. Um, for yourself that can, can be uh, beneficial. So um, with that, uh, let's talk about kind of um, knowing yourself. Um, you are the expert in your own brain. And it's very important to recognize that you are going to be the most valuable resource when it comes to um, treating memory impairments. Um, I think we have a lot of expectations of doctors and healthcare and things like that, but really knowing yourself uh, and the time you're taking today to learn about memory and kind of maybe think about how this process all works, that's going to be really essential to um, fixing whatever perceptions you have or even trying to maintain what you have. Um, so we want to think about not only, you know, what's happening now, but how did I learn in the past? So when we come up with compensations, 
um, or we're talking about different restorative ways to take care of our brain, we really want to think about what was important for me when I was in school or what did I use when I was working? Um, these are definitely techniques that you have, again, created pathways for that have been successful. And so we may think about kind of returning those to your day to day um, to help you to become effective. So, you know, were you someone who talked things out in a huddle at work? Or did you take notes? Or um, did you like things that were highly visual? Those are all going to be ways that you can sort of bring solutions to the table. Um, and again, you know that best because you're your own expert in your brain. Be patient. Um, I have seen that worry and anxiety is sometimes the most debilitating aspect of someone's memory. Um, I cannot tell you how many interactions I've had with someone where functionally this person was performing pretty well, um, but their perception of their memory was so bad. They would have a memory breakdown. It's, see, I couldn't remember. I couldn't remember the person's that that happens to me every time. And there's this whole cycle that happens in front of my eyes when I see this person and they are so distressed. They had expectations of themselves that they couldn't meet. And all of a sudden, a few minutes is spent talking about it when in fact, what we really wanna to try to get away from is this uh, negative emotional reaction, but instead to say, oh, I can't remember it. Oh, I know, this is what helps me. And then hit the strategy right away. So really trying to be patient with yourself. You know, you just sat through this lecture that you know there are normal changes that we all experience memory changes. Um, and it's a matter of really being able to figure out what's gonna help me in the moment. And I'm gonna try something. And if it doesn't work right away, that's okay because I can try something different or I can call someone who can help me. Um, it's really important to try to shift into a different mind space because that negativity and impatience, um, it's not that it's not understandable, it's just not helpful. And it's always trying to get away from things that are not gonna be beneficial is, is a good idea. So as a speech pathologist, a lot of what I do with people with memory is we try to figure out, well, what's gonna work for you, what type of technique and strategy. So sometimes it's an internal memory strategy um, which is something that happens inside of your brain. Uh, if you've read any books that talk about, you know, try to do things with your other hand or try to remember your grocery list without uh, writing things down, that's sort of your, your internal memory strategy. Um, the picture that you see here on the right is a memory palace where there are people who compete in these memory competitions where the more elaborate, off the wall, crazy associations you can make, the more effective uh, your memory will be for those, those, those things. But you don't have to create something super complicated like this. Uh, mnemonic devices, uh, acronyms, you know, I know the Great Lakes because I know homes. Um, I'm trying to teach uh, people about signs of strokes. So I use Be Fast, right? Which is an acronym for all the different signs um, that you may be experiencing. So those are nice ways to kind of consolidate and condense information into one, you know, sort of code that you can then break down. Uh, visual imagery is very effective. It's using your mind's eye to think about where did I put that thing? Where was I? Um, that's a, this memory palace thing really taps into that visual memory. Rehearsal, again, manipulate that information over and over again so that you can really lay it down, lay down those tracks in your brain. So writing, reciting, repeating, really handling that information over and over again, you're more likely to hold on to it associations. If you see me and I look like your cousin, maybe you'll remember your cousin's name starts with L. And so you think, oh, that's Lauren. She looks like my cousin whose name also starts with an L. Um, categorization is big. I do this when I go to the grocery store because I think about the different departments in my grocery store. And I think about the things I try to need and I try to put myself in that place. So I always tend to go in the same pattern. Um, one of the things that the brain health people say is you should try something novel, like next time go the other way in the grocery store. But I know I tend to rely on categorization uh, and organization. So I like to definitely go region by region and think about what do I need in this part of the store. Um, and then chunking. So we know that long, big strings of information are tough to remember. Um, but if we break down into smaller units, we're more li likely to remember that. So phone numbers are a great example. You know, um, you remember three numbers and three numbers and four numbers, right? And much easier to do than remembering them all in one contiguous string. 
Um, so internal memory strategies, that's kind of a brain health exercise in general. So if you're thinking about, you know, something that you want to try to do to um, kick it up a notch, you know, there's functional information as much more um, practical than a lot of brain games. Uh, your Sudoku, your crossword, if you like them, do them. But these mental manipulations are actually better for you in terms of brain function. They tend to generalize more into everyday activity. And then, of course, external memory strategies are huge. And it's a combination usually of both that we're working on. Um, this can be a calendar, a planner, a to-do list, uh, writing things up in a whiteboard so that, you know, if you're living in a household with someone else, making sure you have all of, everyone has eyes on the prize. Um, of course, we're living in a technologically, you know, advanced society. So your laptops, your tablets, your smartphones, your watches. Now we have all these uh, smart speakers that can give us all sorts of cues to help us remember. Those are definitely things that um, I tend to really utilize both myself, but with my clients, but sometimes we have to look at the efficiency. You know, someone may be using um, a calendar they got for free from the bank and the boxes are, you know, real tiny. We may say, you know what? I love that you're writing things down. I love that you can carry this everywhere. It's not giving you the space you need to really remember information or, you know, you're writing things on different pages here. Let's really look at streamlining this. Um, I have a client who um, we're working on her memory for um, to-do lists, and she tends to get into her computer or into her phone, and suddenly she's looking at things that are totally unrelated. So we're looking at a voice notes app where she can just pick up her phone, say what she needs to remember, and then put it down again because the visual distractions are significant that prevent her from actually efficiently writing down a to-do list. So we just have her do that with her phone because her phone is in her pocket all the time. And we want that phone to be able to alert her when she needs to remember something. Um, so these are really wonderful. They're always changing though. Um, and some people are just not high tech people and that's totally okay. Um, you know yourself and you know what you're capable of. And even if your grandson brings you his iPad and sets you up with this sophisticated system, if that doesn't work for you, it doesn't work for you. And we move aside, right? We don't, we don't try to learn something that's too complicated. That's out of our uh, capacity. We're looking at trying to be um, successful. Low tech, high tech, doesn't matter. And then there's the overall environment, right? So this is really where, especially for people who are dealing with mild cognitive impairment, we really wanna look at how can we make your house, your, your environment um, successful. So having a routine is always something we focus on when we're looking at people, especially with brain injury, is that if we just have someone who has sig more significant memory problems, if we're doing the same thing in the same order, in the same place, the brain starts to anticipate this and starts to understand, oh, okay, this is what happens when I'm in this space. Um, having everything in its place, obviously organization is key. Um, having things placed as a visual cue. So for myself, if I really need to leave the house with something before I go uh, to bed, I will put that thing right by my front door. Um, I started doing that when I had little babies and my brain was all over the place and it has been a really effective strategy. So uh, visual placement uh, is a key is important. Um, having an organizational home base is also good. So um, there's some really great resources that I sent um, to Katie that she'll distribute to you some websites and one of them I think is a link that really talks about creating an organized home for someone with a, a dementia so that we really have a, a home base where the keys, the wallet, the glasses, the chargers, the calendar, all of that is in that one location. Um, and then you practice going to that location over and over again. And you're reducing clutter, which I know a lot of people are kind of struggling with if you've had a lifetime of experiences and pictures and items, um, but clutter definitely can impact one's ability to efficiently remember um, or find things. And then avoid multitasking. Um, I think people pride themselves on being able to do a lot of things at, at one time. Uh, and when we have a breakdown, we complain that we can't multitask. Well, multitasking actually turns out to be terrible for the brain. We don't actually effectively multitask as much as we alternate, we shift our attention from one thing to the next 
And what they're finding is every time you shift and transition, you're losing something. And so the strategy that we really try to encourage is pick a prioritize what you want to do and then dedicate for those things that require more time, dedicate set time to that, maybe 45 minutes if it's kind of a, a, a big goal oriented activity and don't do anything else. Um, reduce your distractions, take those things away that you're trying to do simultaneously. And then when you're done with that 45 minute period, take a break, let your brain recharge. Then you can go and tackle that other thing. But it's really about prioritization, filtering out the unnecessary so that you can focus. Okay, so let's talk about wellness. It's noon, we're almost done. You guys are doing great. I can't see you, but I hope you're hanging in there. So number one, when we think about wellness is you have to take care of your health, okay? Your health is absolutely essential for memory function, especially your cardiovascular health. So if your heart is healthy, your brain is healthy. We want blood flow, good blood flow to get up to that brain. So making sure that you're taking medications for chronic diseases like diabetes, high blood pressure, hyperthyroid function, any mental health issues you have, obviously that's part of your health, take care of your health. Review your medications with your doctor. A lot of times there's a lot of miscommunication between physicians. And if you have more than one doctor, trust me, they are not talking to one another. They're probably not paying attention necessarily. If someone has over-prescribed something or prescribed the same thing that you're overdosing on that medication, I wish that they did, but they don't. They're not incentivized by our healthcare system to do that. So it's really important that you empower yourself by showing up to your doctor's office especially if you have memory concerns with a list of your medicines to say, hey, anything here that could be impacting my memory um, because it's important that they analyze that. So they're not gonna do it for you. You need to do it for yourself. Aerobic exercise. Hopefully everyone knows this, but this is one of the most essential things you can do to keep your brain healthy. When you are getting a good workout, uh, could be a walk with a friend, could be just being up and moving around in your house, you're sending oxygenated blood flow to your brain. And there's probably nothing better um, than doing that. Uh, they recommend at least, I think, 150 minutes a day. But as often as possible, you want to be active. In addition to sending that blood flow, we're also possibly releasing um, mo some um, molecules that can help to repair brain cells and make connections. So all the things that we talked about earlier, um, aerobic exercise is really the solution, as is nutrition. So um, the MIND diet, if you haven't heard about that, I think I put a link on the a list to that, but that's the Mediterranean DASH intervention for neurogenitive delay. I think those results just came out this year, um, but it's basically a method of eating for brain health. This is also cardiovascular health too. The DASH diet is something that we use for people who are at risk for cardiovascular disease. Um, and it is non-starchy vegetables, fruits, whole grains, uh, nuts, legumes, seafood, and it's limited red processed meats, uh, sugar sweetened foods and drinks, and refined grains and added salt. So it's probably, um, if you've heard of the Mediterranean diet, the MIND diet is similar. <clears throat> Maximize your perceptual senses. Remember the first step of memory is attention and you can only attend to what you can see and hear. And so really think about that uh, in terms of, you know, is your hearing changing? Um, you know, this is something that people may be resistant to, but hearing is giving us so much sensory input that we need. So um, definitely pursue that. If you need new glasses, go get new glasses. Um, this is definitely things that will, if you think about them, uh, and I know there's a lot of stigma around hearing aids for some people. This is absolutely a brain health tool. So um, there's wonderful audiologists who are my sort of uh, sister field uh, who can help you with really making sure you're choosing a device that's helpful. Sleep is so important. It's for when we consolidate memories. Um, it's for washing out unnecessary proteins in your brain. So uh, really think about sleep. And uh, don't settle for poor sleep. I know our sleep changes as we age, um, but definitely do your due diligence and making sure that your sleep deprivation, if it's happening, that you're talking to the doctor about it. Again, they will not necessarily ask you, but if you ask them about it, they may be able to kind of send you down a path where you can get some good conversations going about sleep interventions. 
new learning activities like today, sitting and listening to this lecture, um, all the things that you may be doing through Friends Life Care, fantastic. Keep it up. Um, participating in things that are not really easy, but not really hard. So in that middle zone is definitely key. And novelty is important too. So new things are helpful. That's why they're always saying, learn a new language, try a new hobby. Uh, it's the novelty that really helps with brain activation. Social engagement, we know it was isolating to be in the pandemic. Hopefully you're finding ways to connect with people on Zoom or you know, socially distanced. Uh, or vaccinated, um, this is really becoming something that is so crucial to brain health. Um, I'll show you really quickly. These are two mice. There's a study of enriched environments and they look at mice in a standard cage with food and water and another mouse and that's it. Uh, and they studied the appearance of the nerve cells and they found that when they amped it up, they enriched that environment where they had multiple places to go, different things to interact with, um, that the mouse was able to grow new connections in the brain. So that's the theory behind that. Hopefully you can take some of this information to heart or as you go into 2022, think about um, new things that you'd like to be able to do towards your brain. And then I wanna just show you this visual because I love it so much. Um, this is a Center for Brain Health graphic. They do research on brain health and they look at brain optimization. They have their own lectures that are kind of complicated, but really interesting. But I really have been using this a lot with my clients because it really shows us everything we just talked about, right? In one image. So your brain systems really depend on good sleep, stress management, um, the purple, which is cognition that really drives everything, right? So not just your memory, but all those other cognitive skills. And then really looking at your daily life, making sure that everything you're doing um, is taking care of yourself, your brain. Uh, and that includes your mindset, obviously your exercise, your fitness, but also having, um, you know, purpose in life, waking up and having a really nice way to engage socially, um, to offer compassion. These are all things that they're finding, um, are so essential to brain health. And I just love it in one graphic. So, um, if you'd like that, or you'd like any more information, um, I think Katie has a bunch of resources. Oop, I went too fast. Uh, or you can send me uh, an email. I love to field questions. And I think we have a bunch of questions, so we'll get to those now. Um, but if you want to know more about me or what I'm doing, um, if you're on Instagram, uh, I post pictures of some of my functional therapy. So you can kind of see me doing what I'm doing at Neurospeech Services. And let's see, we've got 11 questions. Yeah, we so. do. So I know we're a little over time. So if you have to log off, that's fine. Um, we'll go through these as quick as possible. Um, but I want to let everybody know, December 8th, we're having an Avoiding Holiday Scams uh, is our next presentation, so please join us then. In January, we will be doing a Strength, Stretch, and Stability exercise class. It's a four-week series, so as Lauren spoke about, we definitely want to be getting that aerobic exercise, so keep an eye for more information about that. And then check out our website um, under resources. We did a video for caregivers, <clears throat> for people who have cognitive impairments, look for that. And Healthy Brain and Memory Center in Bryn Mawr, um, Katie Riley wrote our blog this month. Okay, so a lot to tell you about. If you have to log off, please take the survey so we know what you thought of the presentation and we can keep bringing you things you like. And now Lauren, if we could try to move through these questions pretty quickly, I think that will get everybody out. Okay. What is the time frame between short and long-term memory? Oh, good question. Um, I mean, it's milliseconds. I don't have the actual number. What a good question. Um, I will just say quickly, I don't know, but it's very quick. Okay. Um, is it a fact that people with higher IQ have a better memory than um, people with average or lower IQ? So IQ is actually kind of falling out of favor as a, a barometer of intellectual capacity. Um, I think that um, with people with high IQ, we have to also look at the background, educational access, resources, things like that. So um, I would say that's not necessarily a reliable tool anymore. Okay, great. Is there an identifiable Alzheimer's gene? Uh, I think they're working on it. Uh, they're definitely trying to figure out what's happening with Alzheimer's. Um, I think if you look at the... Um, if you look at the most recent research, I think they're really looking at not so much a gene, but almost like an immune response and inflammation. Um, I think the failures of a lot of those drugs are showing that it's not just about the plaques, um, but other things that may be um, afoot. 
So people may be disposed genetically, but there may be some other environmental factors that are triggering. Um, there's a doctor who's written a book, Dr. Dale Bredesen. Um, I think it's called The End of Alzheimer's. Um, the book was a little tough for me. There's some, he's on a bunch of podcasts though, if you can listen to those. Um, he's a good resource for trying to understand the process. But what they think is it's actually almost like an infection, that mm -hmm. there's these different triggers that are environmental. Um, they could be genetic. It could be things that we're exposed to in the environment or through our experiences. And then our brain responds to it almost like the way we would respond to a cold or an infection, but it's this inflammatory process that doesn't go great. And so that's why we have these sort of plaques responding. Um, it's sort of a new take on things. Um, and so I think he's a good resource to kind of understand that better. Thank you. Um, could you comment about the effects of Parkinson's disease on memory? Interesting. So Parkinson's uh, is a motor uh, degenerative disease, but there's definitely some um, cognitive implications that can happen with that. I don't know in particular about the impacts of the medications on the memory um, that I can speak to <clears throat> quickly off the top of my head. I do know that sometimes people end up having further deterioration where they end up having some dementia that can that can play uh, out a fault with memory. But in terms of the side effects of the drugs, I'm, I'm not too sure. I know that they can be quite effective. Okay, that's good. Does practicing memory help like learning a language? Absolutely. <clears throat> and honestly, the learning of the language is the memory. So um, I think especially if you've had other experience with memory, excuse me, <clears throat> if you've had experience with other languages in the past, you're sort of able to recall in your um, former experiences, but the act, you know, in order to learn a new language, you have to practice it. And so that's definitely, um, it's just a matter of um, activating new networks um, and taking advantage of other networks that you already have. So definitely a, a wonderful, wonderful recommendation for memory. Any strategies to stop forgetting where you left your phone or keys? It's, <clears throat> it's mostly lack of attention or mindfulness. <clears throat> Absolutely. So we talked about it, the role of attention. Um, I would say make it have one central place where it goes. Um, keep your charger there. Make sure it is in a non-cluttered space. Um, try to, and I know this is so hard, try not to just take your phone everywhere with you or if you have it, maybe stick it in your pocket so that it's not in your hands because what happens is we go into a room, <clears throat> we do something else, we put that thing down. Um, I do this with my coffee cup a lot where I'll say, where's my coffee? And I'll go into my son's room, which is not where coffee cups belong. And it's because I was putting something in there and I put my coffee cup down. So um, everything has its place. Definitely try that and try not to hold on to it when you're trying to do other things, try to put it down. Good. Um, somebody says, do you have any other exercises or games or ideas how to recall those tip of the tongue words or names? So <clears throat> you want to work, uh, in general, you want to work on things that are important to you. So what I love to do and that I recommend for my folks is thinking about um, topics or things that you would like to remember to talk about and write about them. Mm -hmm. So I think journaling is something, I write a journal every single night and I've done it for about 13 years and it's just about my experiences. <clears throat> I love it. And what it does is it will send me, my journal is on my email It'll send me a message of what I wrote yesterday and then what I wrote a year ago. And so I'm constantly exposed to that information. And the idea of writing is also that you're using a different part of your brain to kind of take the experience and put it into language. So I would say try to do some more writing about things you like to do. Okay, wonderful. And I have to smile because we have two people here reminding us that I think, Lauren, you said 150 minutes a day of exercise, but it's a week. And that's okay because <laughs> I didn't know what month it was. So this is all... This is all and normalizing, it's normalizing errors. It's all, it's all okay. okay. 150. A day, I would be, I would be in bad shape if that was the requirement because I'm definitely okay. not making that. It's a week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for fixing that mistake. Can you imagine? Okay. Um, so somebody's asking if the last slide, the summer summary reel, is that in the resources that they'll be getting? Probably not, but I'll send it to you, Katie, and you will send it out. Okay, we, we'll find a way to get that out. That's great. And so everyone, yes, you will get an email tomorrow with a recording for you to share, as, long, uh, as well as a bunch of resources that Lauren put together. Um, and yet, so that answers that other question. Not the slides. This person's asked about the slides. No, but the, the, re, the recording you can certainly watch again. Okay, someone's saying, thank you. I'm just going to answer a few more because um, I know we're, we're really short on time here. So Please don't put any, if you put any more in, I won't get to them today, unfortunately. Okay, I don't know if this is something you can answer, Lauren. Um, what do you suggest for insomnia? Is Benadryl bad? 
I know a lot of people rely on Benadryl. Um, I think a lot of it is you have to understand if there's something happening in your body. Um, I have a patient who's a stroke survivor who has leg cramps. He actually has like neuropathic pain. So a brain signal that's coming in and that wakes him up. Um, so he's someone who Benadryl isn't working and that's because the mechanism that's keeping him awake is more um, pain driven. Um, I would talk to the doctor. I would rule out any respiratory issues like sleep apnea. Um, that can be a real big one where your brain is not getting enough oxygen because you stop breathing intermittently. Um, I think looking at your sleep routine, I think um, watching alcohol and caffeine consumption is big. Um, making sure you're getting exercise uh, throughout your day, but not too late in the day. And then really trying to create a restful routine. Um, there's great uh, apps out there, Headspace, is one where you can get a video on YouTube, pull it up for a sleep meditation, trying to do some things that kind of help your brain to um, clear your thoughts and refocus. Um, I think that those are much more successful than trying to go in a pharmacological route, unless it's something like I mentioned for pain. Okay, we have two more here. What part of the brain or what is it called when a person's memory goes back to the 1940s and every conversation is referenced from that period? So that definitely is something that happens. Um, and again, I think it's about um, the storage of that long-term memory and that sensory experience. If you look at <clears throat> staging of dementia, there's something called the global deterioration scale. Um, that's definitely a phase of a dementia where people tend to go earlier and earlier and earlier. Um, so I don't know that it's a particular brain region, but I think it's almost a, a retrieval issue. We're not retrieving recent information because we're either not learning it or that pathway is less defined. We tend to go to the things that we've retrieved and a lot of times that are emotionally driven. Sure, that makes sense. Okay, here's our last one. I take about 15 medications daily for heart, uh, edema, high blood pressure, depression, gout, and more. My doctor says it's a hopeless task to do eliminations to determine side effects of interactions. Any thoughts? You're definitely a uh, prime candidate for polypharmacy. Uh, that is, <clears throat> I think there's a guaranteed interaction uh, and could be an adverse reaction. I've always heard eight or more. So the fact that you have 15 is a lot. Um, I think you have to really look at your, what your own goals are, what your priorities are, and ask if every single one of them is necessary. Things that promote um, comfort, certainly, and function, I would say are important. Um, things that are, uh, you know, could be maybe addressed through lifestyle changes. You may want to ask about that too. Um, sometimes people can make changes in um, their nutrition and or their hydration or take out a thing like maybe there's um you know other things that are maybe not helpful and that may decrease the necessity for a drug but ultimately you have to look at what is going to take care of the symptoms that are disturbing your life the most and obviously prioritize those medications um i think it's tricky i think you just have to this is your choice you know and so you want to rely on the physicians but you may be able to say if we really had to prioritize what are the things that are most important for me to have a good quality of life right well thank you for staying and uh taking the time to answer those questions a little after our, our noon endpoint so everybody keep an eye for the out for those emails and we will see you um at our next event december 8th thank you so much bye, bye. thank you everyone